Facebook or is it? Anyway, uh, time to move on now to our news panel and where we're going to look at uh, the top news stories that are making the headlines today. I'm delighted to be joined tonight by Matteo Bergamini. He is political commentator and CEO of Shoutout UK and also Jason Reid. And Jason is political commentator and UK lead at Young Voices. A very good evening to both of you. Good evening, David. Hello. Good evening. Well, very nice to see you. Should we just start with uh, with the latest in Ukraine and, and what you believe uh, the situation now is? I I got the sense that, uh, that the change in language and rhetoric coming from Biden, coming from Johnson, means uh, there's sort of a, a change in tone and possibly a, a toughening of resolve. Matteo, what, what are your thoughts? I, I would agree with that. I mean, there's, there's definitely a... Um a toughening of resolve it's still um there's still almost like a, a a stop almost where it's 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 tough but it it won't go beyond um the same rhetoric of if you attack uh, nato members if you go beyond uh, what you're doing in in ukraine then there will be there will be action so it's definitely toughening up but it, there's still that uh, that almost like reserve and and for a lot of reasons um, because of course no one wants a confrontation between NATO and Russia it would end in complete tragedy so there is there is that limitation the European um, Council also put out a press release talking about a Ukraine solidarity trust fund um, you know the Europe is also toughening up on on, on sanctions as well um, so there's there's definitely um, a scaling up um, against against Russia um, but it's still limited in 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 what in what they are willing to do. It seems. So yeah, Jason, uh, what what's what's your view on that? I mean, do you think this is all words? Uh, we saw Biden saying that uh, if Putin uses chemical weapons, NATO would respond in kind, and, and Boris Johnson saying uh, the West reaction would be very very severe. Is this just rhetoric? Do you think? I think that's actually a good example of uh, how the West's leadership has been successful because it seemed, at least from the outside, like Russia wanted to use chemical weapons. Some time ago, they started laying false flags. They started saying that there were, uh, you know, American factories building chemical weapons in Ukraine and all these different things to make it seem like any Im imminent use of chemical weapons was a retaliation rather than them being the aggressor. And yet we've still not seen, as far as we know, the use of chemical weapons in Ukraine. So perhaps they've been dissuaded by the fact that they know there would be more severe uh, action from the West if they were to do that. And so I'm glad to see Biden saying that. Uh, I'm glad to see some strong rhetoric from the West, which um, beyond military aid to Ukraine, perhaps there's not a huge amount more we can do. I think we're now entering a phase where we are allowing ourselves to believe for the first time that Ukraine might just win this. Russia said today that they think the first phase of the war is over. I'm afraid the first phase of the war uh, ended on about day two because they've barely gained any more territory since then because of the amazing resistance mm. of the Ukrainian people. And so now they're focusing on the Donbass regions in the east and perhaps we are inching towards an acceptable, uh, peaceful resolution which does not involve Ukraine becoming part of Russia. Well, I think the strength and resolve of, of the Ukrainians has been absolutely extraordinary. Uh, Matteo, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think it's taken the West by surprise. It's certainly taken Russia by surprise. And it's clear that the Russian troops were ill-equipped. They certainly didn't have enough fuel or food. We've heard about young soldiers getting frostbite and, and actually wanting to leave. So the, the Ukrainian response has been has been something that no one predicted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And it's, and it's interesting because if you look at um, history, history is littered with examples of superpowers or, you know, incredibly powerful countries underestimating um, another country, thinking that the war is going to be quick, it's going to be easy, it's going to be, um, a, a, you know, a, a good victory for Putin at home to to win back support, etc. And of course, none of that's really happened. The Ukrainian resolve has been amazing. And one of the things that I think we're seeing probably for, for the first time is not just a war in Ukraine, but a war on, on social media and the internet, just by the sheer amount of videos, images, and whatever else that is coming out of the conflict. Um, you know, some of it is littered with misinformation, but it's interesting to see that, you know, we've got um, access to unprecedented amounts of information and videos and so forth that, that have come out of that conflict. And, and you're right, they've definitely underestimated, and no one really thought that Ukraine would be able to fight this hard and resist for this long. Uh, let alone potentially come out of this on top. 
Um, but again, history is littered with examples like this. I mean, all you've got to do is look back at, say, you know, Vietnam and the States. Um, it's a prime example of a country underestimating another um, and, and paying dearly for it at home. Yeah, I mean, Jason, we, we're obviously sending, or the West is sending arms, it's sending munitions, it's sending all sorts of things to help the Ukrainians. <laughs> Uh, the one thing I'm struggling with is Zelensky said to NATO that he wanted them to send 1% of their 20,000 tanks. Do you think that's a red line to, to, to actually go that far and to send tanks? I think there is there is more we can do. Um, perhaps we have to do a little bit of guesswork to see uh, just how much you know there is still in the tank that we can send to ukraine there was that leaked footage of, of ben wallace being spoken to by uh, what seemed to be pranksters in russia trying to get details out of him about how much uh, military aid the uk still has at its disposal but i think at this point we should be sending everything we can possibly muster um, some other countries across the west have been have been doing the same to the point that i believe it was in canada one of the lawmakers said um we've got to the point now where we almost don't have an army for ourselves um, which is kind of what we want to see, because we want to see uh, in this emergency situation as much aid as we possibly can being sent to Ukraine to push it over the line so that they can get to the point where Russia feels they cannot go on any longer. Is there a tipping point, Matteo? Because obviously it's been made very clear from the West that there is no way we're going to put boots on the ground. But I get the sense that things are shifting. I said about this change in rhetoric. And I get the sense that Putin, as I have speculated, is a man who I don't think is very well. He's desperate to leave his legacy. I think he realises his campaign is in trouble. We heard in the news headlines that he may well be calling some of his troops back. I simply don't believe it. Do you think there is? this is now reaching a crisis point? I would say so, because if you look at the, the two sides, obviously Ukraine is fighting for, for their lives. You know, if the Ukrainians stop fighting, then there will be no, no more Ukraine or definitely not the Ukraine that we know. Um, but at the same time, as you say, Putin is desperate to leave his legacy. Um, there is, you know, th there's a speculation of how much um, support he's potentially having at home. Um, you know, you, you saw from from that journalist, for example, that that did that incredible protest where she put up a banner um, on, on, I think it was a TV station, um, you know, claiming to stop the war. So that there is there is potentially change at home as well. So there's definitely a tipping point, um, and it potentially is a dangerous one because Putin doesn't want to lose this. He doesn't want this to be his legacy. The fact that he invaded Ukraine and failed, which seems to be the the the, 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 the current narrative that's probably going to happen. Um, it depends on how desperate he gets. And the more desperate he gets, that may force NATO's hand. Hopefully that's not the case because no one wants to go down that road because it will be a horrific one. Um, but it remains to be seen as to how desperate Russia is going to get or if they're going to concede defeat and finally start to, start to retreat and, and do the right thing. Well, I thought what uh, you said earlier on, both of you, about social media and the influence of that is absolutely right. And obviously we know the British government is also now trying to spread the word through social media to, to normal, ordinary Russian citizens about what their government mm -hmm. is getting up to. How important is social media, do you think, in a modern-day conflict? I think it's extremely important. We've seen um, the BBC, for example, has had to resort to shortwave radio to get their uh, world service into Russia. We've been doing everything we possibly can to help ordinary Russian citizens to access free and liberal media, even when it's been uh, under the hammer from Putin, who understandably does not want any anything that contradicts his narrative to be accessible to people in Russia. And so social media, uh, you know, this is the first ever international social media war. This is the first ever chance we have where someone's being invaded, where we have people under an aggressive dictatorial regime like Putin, where he's desperate to control the narrative, and we have a way in thanks to the internet. Yeah. We and do, so it's, yeah, in, it's, Matty, I was going to say, you know, we've seen Russian bots, haven't we, uh, sort of pushing disinformation. Who's, yes. wi who's winning this social media war? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, one of the things that my um, organization does actually is combat disinformation online. And um, one of the things that we're seeing is people are becoming more resilient to it. So I, I'd say that if you asked me that question maybe a couple of years ago, um, especially pre the pandemic, because I think the pandemic woke a lot of people up to um, the possibility of disinformation and how easy it is to twist, you know, stats and figures and facts to suggest a certain narrative, people are becoming more wise to it. Um, and we're seeing this a lot more in the in the uh, in this conflict where people are essentially self 
uh, regulating and being a little bit more critical when they share and engage with content, which is exactly what we want to see in a media literate, as we call it, uh, population. So I'll definitely see that the tide's turning even there, where Russian bots and trolls and so forth are, you know, pushing a variety of conflicting narratives to really try and uh, manipulate what's actually going on. And people just aren't buying it as much as they were maybe a couple of years ago. And that's a really big positive, I'd say. OK, Matteo and Jason, stay where you are for the moment. In the driving seat. This is Talk Radio, the home of common sense. Welcome back. I'm Dr David Bull. I'm with you till 10 o'clock tonight. Uh, we're currently in the news panel. My guests tonight are Matteo Bergamini, who's political commentator and CEO of Shoutout UK, and also Jason Reid, who's political commentator and UK lead at Young Voices. Gentlemen, good to see you. Uh, thank you for staying with us. Let's talk now about um, <laughs> really the most extraordinary appearance by the P&O boss yesterday, um, Peter Hebblethwaite, who admitted to MPs the decision to sack the 800 workers without notice may have broken the law and he'd do it again. What are your thoughts on that, Matteo? I mean, uh, he should resign. <laughs> this is kind of the simple answer. The fact that um, someone can so brazenly say, yes, I've broken, um, I've broken the law or I've, or I've at least broken employment rules um, in, in sacking 800 people. Right? They're not just workers. These are people that are going to have their lives affected, their family's lives affected. And then to admit that he's going to do it again, and then also for allegedly saying that, that he won't do it again to, to his staff. Like, they, they, this, this man seems to be utterly all over the place. And look, you know, when you're running a business as large as that, it, you need to have some foresight. It can't just be that out of nowhere you need to suddenly free up cash flow by, by dropping 800 workers. Like, then there must have been some foresight. Either that or he's completely incompetent. In either case, he's got to go. <laughs> uh, Jason, would you agree with that? He's incompetent or he's got to go? Remember, this poor man's only paid £325,000. Yes, we can all feel very sorry for him for that. No, I'm, I'm with Matteo on this. Um, it's, it's very, very clear that they did not think it through. They did not think beyond the immediate. They thought, brilliant, we can save some money on salaries by uh, sacking all our workers and, and reverting to agency staff who it seems can be paid much, much less without thinking about how everyone else would react to that, without even thinking about uh, the fact that the legal requirement they had to consult the unions before they did that, and they've, of course, already admitted that that does appear to have broken the law, um, but they've done that. Uh, it's just uh, the free market comes to the rescue, doesn't it? Because this PR disaster is going to haunt the P&O brand now for goodness knows how long. Um, I know plenty of people who have said, I will never use P&O ferries services ever again if I can possibly avoid it. It reminds me of the uh, European Super League PR disaster as well. This is just a classic case of people not uh, doing the thinking, not thinking plans through and just going ahead with things uh, in a very, very short-sighted way, which is going to cost them a lot more in the long term than it saves them in the short term. Well, I mean, I thought it was extraordinary, the fact that he actually <laughs> he was so candid and said, well, we didn't go and consult the unions because we know they'd say no, so we didn't bother and we sacked everyone anyway. Matteo. Yeah, I mean, uh, in a way, in a way, you, I almost want to, almost want to applaud the honesty, just slightly, by by him being like, actually, you know, what, I'm not going to make up an excuse. I'm just going to say it outright. That I knew the unions are going to say no, so I'm just going to go throw away all convention, all laws out the window, and just be like, you know what, I'm just going to sack them all. Um, and, and it also just shows how out of touch this individual is by the fact that you know he called a new what was it five pound fifty. 550, Sorry, a 550 yeah. Um, yeah. hourly wage competitive. Um, not in Competitive sure for what, whom? Well, that's, that's, that's the point, right? I don't understand in what world would that be a decent salary. Um, I, it, again, it's had a complete foresight, uh, for complete lack of foresight and a complete lack of business planning, which to me, someone that is in charge of such a large company and needs to take accountability for, Oh, there's something else at play. And again, either case, he's clearly not fit for the job because what? that should not have come 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 to this 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 end uh, in, uh, this rash decision. Well, Jason, I'd love to be sitting in in the uh, the board of directors meeting, you know, when when they talk about the amount of adverse publicity he's managed to to generate. And in some ways, actually, I have to admire his candour as well. You know, we talk about the whole time in politics, no one actually tells the truth. He did tell the truth, and he's been absolutely stuck on a stake for it. Well, that's because when you get to this point, there's not much else you can do. There's no amount of wily corporate speak that can get him out of the hole he's managed to dig himself into. I want to know what 
those uh, leaders at P&O Ferries what they thought was going to happen when they went ahead with this. Did they think that the, the press weren't going to report it? Did they think that the people weren't going to care? Quite clearly, this is um, a case of some very, very highly paid and very highly privileged uh, leadership, people in leadership roles in this company, looking at their balance sheets and looking at their assets and thinking, where can we save the most money? What's the most disposable? And they decided that their workers were the most disposable, people who have worked for them for a long time, who have been loyal, um, and they just decided to put them in the bin uh, in order to save a bit of money, uh, which is, I hope, going to cost them a lot more money now because of the immense damage they've done to their brand. But his response was, well, either we did that or we'll lose the business altogether. So I had to make a very difficult sacrifice. I had to sacrifice the staff, but I've kept the business afloat. Well, the answer to that is run your business a little bit better so that you don't have to sack 800 staff members. Sacking 800 staff members is not a normal thing to happen in the course of anyone running a successful business. There's clearly some very bad decisions that have been made in the run-up to this episode. Uh, but if, if it comes to the point where you can't afford to pay your staff in, and still have a business, that means you don't have a business. It does not mean you fire all your staff all at once and try to uh, save yourself at their expense by employing people on a ridiculously low wage. Matteo. Yeah, I, I would agree and also add that any business requires um, foresight planning. You, 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 you look at your projections and, you, and you, you, know, you, you plan accordingly. And you, know, you should have known or, or someone in the business, someone in the leadership, the reason why you're getting paid so high in, in, in places of that kind of management is because you are meant to look, at, look ahead and understand, okay, where are our cash flow projections? You know, are we going to be short? What difficult decisions do we need to make if we need to lay people off, which, you know, does happen in business. Sometimes you do need to shrink and that's normal. Um, but you should have seen it coming. And the fact that he had to drop 800 workers without notice rapidly suggests that he either didn't see it coming or did not care. Well, the response is exact, is extraordinary, actually. I think they're in crisis management mode now. And he, he responded by saying, well, actually, we're paying people 15,000 up to 100,000 pounds. If you've worked there for a week, you get 15 grand. So aren't we a great employer? Jason, uh, do you think he's in crisis mode? I think he is. I think we can be very clear about what happened here. It's not that they were backed into a corner and they couldn't possibly help themselves. It's not that um, they decided it was going to be a good thing to do for the business. The reason they did this is because they thought they could get away with it. They thought they would fly under the radar. They thought that people wouldn't care enough to put up any kind of resistance or to change their habits and try and boycott the, the brand or anything like that. As it happens, um, it gives us, you, uh, you know, we can be very proud to be British that we did uh, produce a huge amount of resistance, which is going to cost that company a lot. Um, we've had people uh, examining what they did to work out where exactly they broke the law, and it feels like they might now feel the full weight of the law, um, certainly in, in a financial sense, with having to pay people off. Um, so this is exactly what is supposed to happen in a, in a free market when somebody behaves in the way that P&O Ferries did. We couldn't have responded any better, I don't think, to what happened. Well, I, I get the sense that even the politicians are, are slightly flabbergasted that British law allows this to happen, even though... Uh, and, and you've even heard the Prime Minister saying that he should resign. But actually, isn't, isn't the part of the problem that actually that the government has loosened the regulations to allow this to happen so that you can... They wouldn't do it in many other countries, and I think they've taken advantage advantage of that and I think also as a Brit as a proud Brit I'm not sure I want anything to do with P&O Matteo no I agree I mean I, I, I certainly won't and I, and, and I think a lot of people probably feel the same way um, I would say that yeah I mean that there is an issue here where we have um, deregulated to such an extent that they've essentially used a loophole to allow them to to do this and, and potentially get away with it on a legal slash um, on, a, on a legal or an employment rule side um, and, and I would disagree slightly with, with Jason here about the, the free market. This is the free market. You know, the free market is where, you know, you, you are essentially, businesses are essentially allowed to do what they need to do to survive and, and to compete. Um, and actually what we're seeing here is a reaction against that where people are saying, actually, this is not okay. Businesses should not be allowed to get away with this. And actually we do need more regulation, which is contrary, of course, to the, to the free market. But it shows that actually what we need is a balance. We need the government to step in, and it's great to see Boris Johnson back calls for, for, for his resignation. It's great to see MPs um, waking up to this reality and actually understanding that things need to be done about this. Businesses need to be regulated in a way that doesn't allow them to get away with getting rid of 800 people because of mismanagement from the top. And, and finally, let me just uh, uh, pause this particular conversation. Jason, do you think he will resign? 
I think he might have to. I think if the pressure stays at, at the current level that it is, which I hope that it will because people are so angry about this, uh, it seems like he doesn't have much longer to stay in that position. And it also seems like that position won't be a very attractive one to stay in if P&O Ferries is really in the dire straits that he certainly wants us to believe it in. It, it's in, then who would want to continue leading it? Well, Matteo, your thoughts on that. Do you think he'll resign? I kind of have to agree. I think he will eventually. I think he, he will try and hang on for as much as possible. Um, just because someone that is that brazen um, in their admission to parliament is not someone that cares about public opinion. So I think it'll take a lot to dislodge him, but I think eventually he'll be forced to. He might care when all the politicians gang up on him and his board of directors do as well. I think you're, you're probably both right. I think he probably does have to go. Uh, Matteo and Jason, stay there and join us after the break. Uh, anyway, we, uh, we, uh, you're joining us when we're actually looking at the stories that are making the news. And uh, joining me tonight is Matteo uh, Bagamini, who's political commentator and CEO of Shout Out UK, and Jason Reed, political commentator and UK lead at Young Voices. Thanks again gentlemen for staying with me um let's move to a story and there it's very rare that I, I i i read news stories and my mouth drops open but the article in the telegraph and the the headline is nicholas sturgeon uses ukraine war to make tasteless new case for scottish independence this is a woman who just won't stop she reminds me of those whack-a-moles you keep whacking her and she just won't go away uh how many times do we need a, an independence referendum and what has that got to do with ukraine um um, let's start with you, Matteo. What were your thoughts when you saw this? I mean, it, it, listen, if if we had British tanks rolling across the border into Scotland and we occupied their parliament and started doing all sorts of, um, you know, potential war crimes, then fine, fair enough, compare it to Ukraine. But that is clearly fantasy and clearly not the case. Um, it, it's an issue when when you have politicians linking linking trivial things like this to, to to an actual conflict which is which is killing people and displacing millions like that's the reality in ukraine and to put that and try to use that to make to score political points is just it's it's dark is what it is and i mean boris johnson did the same thing comparing the conflict to the brexit vote we've got politicians that are just incredibly incredibly out of touch unfortunately in the uk and um, I think it's just dark comparing something that tragic to score political points. Jason, do you think it was political oversight? What was it? The fact that she's so blinkered. I mean, from my from my side, I thought it was disgusting. I thought it actually was incredibly disingenuous, and I thought it just undermined the severity of what people are going through in Ukraine. Just a huge humanitarian crisis. It very much does. This crisis that's going on in Ukraine is not about us. It's not about Scottish independence. It's not about the West. But it's amazing how so many politicians, generally politicians on the left, have the ability to take anything that happens in the world and make it about themselves and make it about the issue that, that they care about, their pet issue in Nicola Sturgeon's case, of course, Scottish independence. The logical leaps she had to make to make her point <laughs> are, are quite logical. Incredible. Well, illogical, exactly. The uh, the lack of logic and the leaps that she makes. She claims that uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine shows the importance of being part of the European single market and therefore that Scotland needs to be out of the UK in order to rejoin the EU. There are so many different logical problems with that, not least the fact that it's, it's military alliances that have come to the fore. Uh, the, in, being a member of NATO, it's become very clear how important that is. We've seen Western countries committing to more defence spending. What we've not seen is the UK suddenly regretting Brexit because of Putin invading Ukraine. If anything, actually, we were leading the world in providing aid and support to Ukraine before the European Union ever did, um, despite Brexit. Well, of course, I worked in the European Parliament. I was an MEP there, and the one thing the European Union is very good at is not not making decisions and certainly countries don't work together we've seen that with Russia the fact is Germany is far too dependent on Russian gas to actually impose these draconian tariffs um Matteo what what is she doing in terms of this do you is this her her sole mantra because actually if you look at the Scottish economy it's in trouble if you look at the facts under the Barnet formula they get a lot of money from the United Kingdom government and they get about 129 pounds per head in England that equates to about 100 Scottish people get more money from the British taxpayer. I mean, it, it, it's 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 something that, that again, her um, her political career, her political party's career is based off of independence. Like that's again, we we, talk, we talked about legacy and Putin's legacy in the previous you know in the previous story. Um, there are politicians, um, Boris Johnson's another one, which which look at legacy and Nicola Sturgeon's 
um, wish for legacy is that idea of, of, of getting that second referendum um, and, and, and getting Scottish independence. And it seems that um, that's kind of all that matters. You know, as you say, Scottish, uh, Scot Scotland's economy is in trouble, but, um, you know, distracting everybody by focusing on on, on the push for independence is is, is kind of a, a great way of, of keeping that, that political relevance that some may argue she may or may not have. And look, I understand the argument of Scottish independence. We had the Brexit vote twice. Um, there is absolutely no reason why she shouldn't have, uh, she shouldn't be allowed to give the Scottish people another voice. Now I, I thought it was once changed. in a lifetime, once in a generation. Um, what, the, the Scottish or the, or the Scottish. Brexit? Brexit. Um, yeah, there were a lot of things said in that referendum. There were a lot of things said in the Brexit referendum, which turned out not to be true. Um, so, I mean, the politicians go back and forth. I mean, not, not to sound too cynical. <laughs> I hope that's not levelled at me. <laughs> no, not at all. But, I mean, it's it's something that, you know, you, you, you see politicians say things and then go back. And I think that this, this opens up a whole wider conversation about the honesty of politicians that... The, the kind of clout that we've currently got, or the group, sorry, that we've currently got of politicians that say things to score political points. And in the case of Nicola Sturgeon, it's her legacy, it, it's what makes her relevant. If the idea of Scottish independence, that whole argument disappears, because it doesn't become relevant anymore, she has no career, she has no legacy. I, I, I mentioned this the last time I, I was uh, hosting a show here on Talk Radio, and I said that my issue is that I don't think we have enough politicians who've had real life experience who understand what real people think and right now with the spiraling yep. cost of living crisis is scottish independence on the top of everyone's list answer no jason absolutely right she's completely out of touch uh, i think from the ukraine crisis one of the key lessons we've learned is how important it is uh, that when countries across the world and especially across the west share values and share culture that we remain close together that we have those close alliances and coalitions so that when crises do emerge we can help each other out and still nicola sturgeon clings to this weird ideology of separatism of closing the door on the rest of the world on withdrawing from uh, from your your closest neighbors and your closest confidants I think Nicola Sturgeon needs to learn to read the room. This is not the time for her inane discussions about Scottish independence. It's not the time for her to call to rerun the referendum because she didn't like the results she got last time. This is a time for us to help Ukraine and to stand up against Russia. It's not about Scotland. It's, it's exactly. And there's a dichotomy here because at the same time she wants separatism. She wants to move away from the integration in the United Kingdom only to join a bigger club which will become a federal Euro state. That to me Matteo makes no sense. I mean, it, it is massively contradictory. I mean, obviously for me, I um, I, I believe that that more integration is better. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not going to turn this into a Brexit debate. But I, I <laughs> no, that was, we'll be here all week, was, <laughs> right? Um, but I, you know, I, I I believe that we're stronger together. And um, you know, whatever your opinions are on Brexit and how that went, you know, that decision is done and we move on. And it shows that actually with the response in Ukraine bar obviously the way we, we've handled refugees which is um could have been better um we've actually showed a united front which is which is great to see um the fact that we can work with the european union and see its benefits and they can see our benefits when there is a crisis um with regards to scotland however you know joining and making an independent scotland and then joining the european union again i'm a fan of the european union but that logic for me makes no sense Mm, mm. I just want to uh, talk about that, the Ukrainian crisis and the, and the refugees. And I think what that showed, and I was listening earlier, actually, to, to Rob's show, and he's right. If you look at the Ministry of Defence, their response has been extraordinary to the Ukrainian crisis. But actually, uh, when you look at the Home Office, it's been pitiful, hasn't it, Jason? There's certainly a lot of criticisms we can, uh, we can level at the Home Office. Um, a lot of them not to do with uh, taking the wrong stance. The Home Office is uh, very much agreeing. Priti Patel made her, her speech in Blackpool very much agreeing that we need to be generous to refugees, that we need to be helping them out and doing everything we can. So it just becomes an issue of, of competence and bureaucracy and paperwork with so many people caught up in the red tape unable to uh, come and, and join their family in, in Britain or to make their way to Britain having fled the war zone in Ukraine and so we need to do a lot better. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your time tonight. That's Matteo Bergamini and Jason Reed. Thank you very much indeed. I